Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we'll start seeing participants flying through. We're streaming live on Facebook. Um, we uh, we have uh, an esteemed colleague um, from the uh, automotive recycling industry slash insurance industry, part of the panel today, uh, CEO of uh, the United Recyclers Group in the US, uh, Don Porter. Don, welcome. Thank you very much. Great to be here. How are we going over in sunny Texas? I know you've got a bit of uh, a pandemic on your hands over there, as they say, but uh, how, how are you guys going there? That's, that's working out really well. There's some hot spots. Houston's one of them. Downtown Austin is, but I live in a little community outside of Austin and uh, restaurants are open where you can go in and eat and have fun. And, and uh, I think most of the bars are shut down, but uh, it's uh, pretty pleasant. I know I can still get on the golf course without wearing a mask. That's all I care about. That's good. But you can't have a drink without, uh, without, with the mask on. So that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, conferences get a bit funny at times. So you haven't had one of those. So you probably need a bit of a drink. Well, absolutely. You know, you don't even have to wear it. Once you're in the restaurant and you're at your chair, at your seat table, you don't have to wear a mask. You just pull it off and hang out. Fair enough. Very good. Well, hopefully things continue to not be too bad for you there. Um, That's great. Chad, how are you going? Doing good. Doing good. Is that sun in the background or is that clouds? No, it's uh, it's a little bit of cloud, but uh, it looks to be a decent day. But it's going to be uh, still a cool day here in Melbourne. It's amazing. Chad and I are about five kilometres or three miles apart from one another, and I've got beautiful sun and he's got grey clouds. I don't understand that. But anyways... <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, so today we're talking a little bit about the uh, automotive recycling industry, obviously, um, the future of automotive recycling, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper into things like ADAS and uh, technology and how that's going to affect uh, industry, but the, we'll talk a little bit about interchange and, and how interchange and URG's view of how interchange uh, helps, but also the opportunities for improvement there with regard to um, automotive recycled parts or ROE parts being made available to different segments, different customer bases, such as in the insurance and collision repair industry. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with other technologies at slightly outside of our industry, you know, maybe in the collision repair industry and how uh, a collision repair from FNOL or first notice of loss through to uh, the repair of that vehicle, all the total loss of that vehicle will look in the future. And as a result, how we as an industry can uh, work within that framework. So um, I won't hold it up any longer. I want Don, if possible, if you can give us a little bit about your background firstly, um, and secondly, where your role with URG and what URG is up to and what it looks like. Well, I've already got a little infomercial for URG, so you'll have to, to bear with me on that one. But, you know, I started in the uh, insurance industry in 1977, writing estimates out in the, the boonies for State Farm, handling bodily injury claims, and worked my way up through to the corporate headquarters as an internal consultant for State Farm, and spent 20 years in there working with uh, auto property losses, uh, catastrophe, and salvage. Um, so I've been involved in the industry for quite some time and spent a lot of great years with uh, ARA and, and uh, URG back even when I was working for uh, State Farm. So it's, uh, they've kind of indoctrinated me into the industry, uh, whether I wanted to go quietly or kicking and screaming, but uh, it worked out pretty well. So that's uh, basically my background. It's, uh, I've been uh, now with URG. I'm trying to think since August of 12. So uh, pushing on seven years, eight. So yeah, I've had a great a time while. working with, with uh, URG and, and being a part of it and their CEO. So, but you want to get, let me just start my little informational if that's all right with you. That'd be great. Anytime I can get credit for the organization, I'm, I'm wanting to do it. But URG and United Recyclers Group was founded in 1995. It's by recyclers and for recyclers. Its original purpose was to facilitate the creation of a new yard management system that would streamline business operations and improve inventory management. You know, today, URG helps our members maintain their competitive edge in the industry by providing access to a new, unique portfolio of business tools, 
innovative technology, data protection, e-commerce solutions, operational support, and much more. URG has developed tools to aid recyclers in maintaining data accuracy and allowing recyclers to share the data with other yards and business partners. URG is also known for its annual educational conference, which hosts recyclers worldwide. Currently, URG has 474 members with over 625 locations in the U.S. and Canada. It includes full service and self service auto recyclers. In 2017, URG Insurance Company was established. It's a captive insurance company. It's domiciled in North Carolina and provides the recyclers an opportunity to self insure some of their own business risk. URG Warranty Reimbursement Insurance Program helps the recyclers reinsure warranty claim payouts. URG Enterprise Risk Management Program reinsures or helps the recycler reinsure other risk inherent to their business needs. URG also established the URG Scholarship Foundation, which we're proud of, provides post-secondary educational scholarships and trade and vocational scholarships. This year, we provided $40,000 in scholarships. URG Warranty Claim Program was established uh, two years ago. And we have a team of ASE master certified technicians that handle selected drivetrain warranty claims for recyclers that participate in the program nationwide. And as a company, we continually evaluate the business needs of recyclers and strive to develop business solutions for the future, which is what we're talking about today. Those solutions that can handle and manage the recycling industry for years to come. That's my infomercial. That's it. That's it. I'll tell you what, nice little commercial uh, for URG there. But I think uh, I've, uh, and we met originally, Don, probably in the late 2008-ish type of era. Um, you used to attend all the URG conferences on behalf of um, State Farm. And right. I do remember very clearly one of the uh, conferences, I think you were, uh, I think you were the, the keynote with Allstate, someone from Allstate Insurance that year. Yeah. Uh, you probably remember that. And uh, it's one thing I clearly remember, and I think I've written something, uh, I've referred to in one of the articles I've written, but, um, you know, you got questioned on why don't insurance companies use more recycled parts in the repair process? You know, we're gold seal and we're this and we're that, and you should be using our parts and so forth. Um, and the reality is that we're, we're still not there yet, are we, as, as an industry, I suppose, to service the collision repair industry exactly the way it needs to be serviced. And we may not ever be there exactly, but certainly there are things that we need to continue doing as individual businesses in the recycling industry but also as a as a broader industry yard management systems interchange connectability to, with other technologies how we work uh, rather than just operationally and tactically on a daily basis but how do we work strategically with organizations such as insurance companies and their networks so can you tell us a little bit about from a, an insurance company perspective, if we can sort of look through the eyes of an insurer for a minute, what are some of the challenges that um, an insurer has when looking to use reclaimed parts or recycled OE parts? You've got to look at the legislative edicts of each market that you're in or each state that you're in to make sure what parts you can use on what vehicles and what range and list of year models that might be affected. But realistically, you know, and I can talk from a state farm point of view back when I was there is that, you know, we wanted to use the, the economical parts that we could use, but good quality parts that would ensure the vehicle gets back into the safe repaired condition. Hmm. Um, and we really allowed the collision industry to make a lot of those decisions for us. And so that was, especially when we went to service first and then select service back in those days, uh, and use consolidated, you know, consolidators and and uh, DRPs to handle, you know, the claims operation for us. Um, the one problem you get into is the quality of the part is is got to be good if it's going to go to the collision industry. But there's also credits that apply to that, and the collision industry, if it comes in with a little damage, can and get that taken care of. But, and you know, you'll have to tell me if I can talk about this or not, but one of the biggest issues that we have in this, and, and one of the, the questions that I got at URG that I thought I was gonna get tarred and feathered and sent out on, 
was the simple fact that why don't you just raise the markup on the part, okay, mm -hmm. to help to facilitate that? Well, I mean, that's all good and said when, it, when you think about it, but you can only change the pricing level so much where it's not competitive with, you know, collision repair part or the OE part, uh, and that's not really doing anybody good. But there may be a new process or there may be something that can be utilized to help change that margin difference for the collision industry. Because I think, you know, it's not all collision industry and some collision industry, you know, they get bad parts, okay? And it's not as described. And so there are issues with the parts, but I think realistic, there's also issue with the margin that they get on those parts. Because if they use an OE, then they'll get 25 or 35% discount, whatever they've negotiated. And that's all, that's great. That's what they need to do. They make profit on there and they need to make the profit on the part to stay in business. Anybody does. So if you start using a, a, a $100 part compared to a $400 part or a $200 compared to a $400 part and you get 25% markup, the margin's not there. And, and again, they need to make the right margin to make it work. But what may be able to be done if the insurers, the collision industry and the recyclers start looking at this is to change the way that we price and that the insurance company price those parts for the collision repair facility. <coughs> so let them make the same dollar margin on parts that they would make on the OEs. And so it's, I mean, it's kind of simple. You take a hundred dollar OE part, they get 25% discount, they get 25 bucks off. So they made $25 on the part. Well, just add that $25 to a $25 part and you get the part for $50 on the estimate. You know, it makes it competitive, makes yep. it easy and yep. makes it worth, worth purchasing if it's a quality part. Yep. So, so I think that's, it's, it's a no brainer. I mean, um, you know, uh, it's the type of stuff that we've been preaching for a long, long time. And uh, I think we're at a, a tipping point, Donna. There's always the right time and the wrong time. Um, I did a lot of work with Insurance Australia Group here in Australia between 2003 and 2010, 11. Um, and we changed the pricing mechanism, right? And we did a lot of work uh, preparing for it and looking at what impact that would have on the claim cost. Um, if we allowed the repairer to make a 25% of the new price margin on their recycle part. So if the recycle part cost, let's say 10% of the OE part, and they were making 25% of the OE part, um, you know, you add that 25% onto the 10%, they're still only paying 35% of the OE price to use a reclaim part, right? So we did a lot of work on that. And the, the, there was an average saving of over a million dollars per percentage point change in usage. That's in Australian volumes, which, you know, usually if we look at Australian volumes, it's about 15 times less than the US volumes. So you do the numbers, right? So yeah. um, there is no doubt incentivizing the repairer to use reclaimed parts makes a big difference. And this is not having a shot at insurance companies or anything like that. It's more so saying, how can we, we have a common interest here. Um, the automotive recycling industry, the insurance industry and the collision repair industry and I'm going to throw it in here, the OE parts industry has a common interest, okay? And that is to keep that vehicle repairable. And if we can keep that vehicle repairable, subject to it being a technically repairable vehicle, that is, it's not damaged too badly that you shouldn't repair it, um, then it becomes a commercial proposition. Is it economically viable to repair that vehicle versus total lossing that vehicle and getting your money from salvage, which you'd know all about? Um, but, um, you know, if the, the key element here in my view, and one of the things that I've been talking about over and over for the last 15 years has been, how can we make the repairer, how can we put the repairer in the same or better position economically, commercially to use a reclaimed part versus an OE part, right? And that's the trick. And when we did this in the Australian market, we doubled usage within three months in that group of repairers that we were trialing with. Okay, the trial ended up going for three years and we had 600 repairers on this trial across, across Australia. Um, and all the, all the problems disappeared with reclaimed parts. Quality problems disappeared. Um, 
policyholder issues disappeared. Again, from an insurance company perspective, one of the issues with insurance companies is that all of a sudden they get Mrs. Jones calling saying, are you using a dirty old junkyard part on my car? Versus uh, Mrs. Jones is now really happy to use what the collision repairer has now sold to her because they're making the money in it as a, an environmentally friendly original equipment part that's been reclaimed from another vehicle. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that's supposed to last the life of the car. Yeah, and that's the same part. It's just that we've we've marketed it differently, and the collision repair is critical to that. So making sure they've got the right margin is critical. Well, and I think to that point, the 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 insurer and the collision <laughs> industry and the recycler are going to have to coordinate their efforts to manage that correctly and go through the process to, you know, the recyclers may have to take another look at how they price their parts, you know, for their wholesale or retail value that they want. So it, it, when you add that, that um, margin on there, it may take their part too close to the OE. So they may have to decide that they can bring it down a little bit, but they'll sell more parts and gain more revenue by, by doing that. So it's not a matter of making as much money as you can on each part. It's about sustaining a good business model that you can sell more parts and, and have a reputable business, you know, uh, model that helps everybody through the process. And so, uh, you know, I, I, to me, it will work. You know, I've been preaching this for years and years and years, that this is the right way to do it, to make the collision industry whole. Yep. You know, Indeed. nobody wants to make them where they can't make their revenue and they can't make their payroll and they can't get through the process. Right. To make it easy, efficient for them to go. Two things have to happen to make this model work. The, the recyclers have to price their parts at a percentage of OE list, and the insurers have to change the way they reimburse, reimburse their repairers. Uh, and so, I mean, we've just described exactly what has to happen, and then, boom, we could uh, see the utilization of ROE parts go through the roof as a result of that. And, um, and, and I agree with you completely, Don. Yeah. The, the interesting part of this is the dynamics are there because the estimating applications could each build the algorithms that are necessary that, you know, you could do this on a pricing point that's just a, an average across the board. If everybody gets 25% discount, you just manage it on 25% discount and pay that way. But there's an, there should be a, a mechanism for them. If I'm a collision industry, if I'm a, a body shop, and I get 22% from one OE, and I get 25% from an OE, and 28% from another, then they could put those into the application, estimating application, so it would automatically figure the discount and put it on the, est I mean, figure the margin and put it on the estimate for recycled, just like it does for the OE. So there's, there's simple methods to handle it. It may take some programming time, but it would be worth it in the long run to facilitate, you know, the good quality repairs of vehicles using OE parts, whether they're reclaimed or not. So it all makes sense, right? It all makes a lot of sense. Um, and I want to, I don't want to let this go because it's something that I've been passionate about for 15, 20 years now. Um, but I can, I can sense, I can feel a lot of recyclers saying, but hold on, I can't get enough of those hoods, fenders, doors, whatever it is that they're talking, we're talking about here. And my system's telling me, or I can see we've got Peter Bishop on the phone here. Peter, how are you going? Um, Peter from uh, um, uh, Pinnacle, CCC these days. Um, but Pinnacle, for example, has a selling recommendation tool. Um, and we're not trying to undermine those traditional methods of pricing parts. But the selling recommendation says this is a no discount part done. And it may be at whatever the percentage of the OE price is, but it's $1,000. Maybe the OE price is 1200 but maybe there aren't enough OE parts out there. I don't know, whatever. There's a shortage. or People want as many of these products as possible. Um, we need to... Uh, my view is that we need to look at uh, the way we price our parts. Most of our parts are priced well. Let's be clear. 80% of our inventory is priced so that the automotive uh, collision repairer can buy the part. Right. That 20%, the high volume part, which remember is, the, is the, the high volume part that they want as well, is priced above the odds. Why? Because we can't get enough of them as a recycler. But ultimately, if we take a long-term view of a salvage vehicle and the parts that are available for harvest of that vehicle, 
if we look at that vehicle and say, well, hold on, if we sold more parts, if we harvested more parts off the asset and reinvested those back into the collision repair industry and the insurance industry, we'd make more money because we've harvested more parts. Now, it's a long-term strategic view, and I think I alluded to this earlier in the, in the discussion, and that is what's the tactical view versus what's the strategic long-term view. It's very difficult to do that as an industry. As an individual business, you can make that call. As an industry, it's a lot more difficult because you know, you've got a, a number of different organizations that need to determine their own uh, hip pocket profitability on a daily basis. But that's one of the challenges. And I can hear the recycler thinking down that path. Chad, I mean, uh, from your perspective, would you want one of your uh, salespeople selling that hood that you can get $500 for every day that you've only got one in stock of for 300? No, it, that wouldn't make sense because you need to capitalize on what you can. And there's some uh, exceptions to the rule about availability. I mean, we, we talked about that. Uh, there was a, was it a Chevrolet truck or a Ford truck uh, bed assembly that wasn't available in the U.S. for a period of about six months. And, yeah. and the, the used value, the ROE value of that, that bed went through the roof because it wasn't available. And there was such demand for it coming to our side of the industry that we could get more money for it. And so there are exceptions to the rule if there is no... Uh, uh, original OE, uh, OE part available, the use one is going to be worth more money as simple uh, laws of supply and demand. But yeah, um, so that's the exception to the rule. I mean, that's the, the, the 2% uh, type exception. Uh, the 98% rule is, is that, you know, we need to be competitive and then the reimbursement model needs to change and the utilization of used parts needs to increase. Uh, so. But real is it, realistically to that, there's no harm, no foul in that. I mean, it's just, it, like you said, it's supply and demand. And, and the collision industry or the body shop is not going to be concerned that they have to use a new OE instead of a recycle at that point if the demand for the recycle is such that they can get better money on it. So, you know, and, and really, I don't know that there's a shortage or the, of, of parts out there as there is the ability to get those parts moved and distributed appropriately across the nation. And that's where, you know, firms like our PRP comes into place and and uh, distribution systems and the sharing of data and data tiering with one recycler to another, because I may not have it in my yard, but I've got it in somebody else's yard and the demand may not be there for them for that part. And so it, it can be taken from one market area to another market area to be able to be utilized. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can be done to help manage the supply chain on that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, moving on a little bit, but very related to this, I want to sort of talk about, we've been talking more hypothetically at this stage and potentially some things that happened uh, historically, um, where it could go in the future, margin opportunities for repairers and so forth, but a live environment at the minute, you know, I, I was on eight hours ago, I was on a, a webinar, um, hosting a webinar for eBay and Aviva insurance in, in the UK um, with 20 odd collision repairers uh, launching a pilot program over there where um, eBay has built a B2B uh, business to business platform that suits the automotive uh, industry, suits the collision repairer. So the collision repairer can find all the parts on their bill of materials on their estimate in one swoop and order them through that eBay platform. Um, we've got 168 odd um, automotive recyclers that are, they call them um, ATFs in, in the UK, uh, VRA members, Vehicle Recycle Association members that are uh, applying for the independent certification program there, their, their applications are in. eBay has actually put £400,000 in the, in the pot to support those recyclers over the next, uh, well, they've already done it. Um, they offered that money up in July and was taken up. So, four hundred thousand pound, Chad. You're better with conversions. You pound to US. What's it about six hundred thousand? Six hundred and six hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Yep. So six hundred and fifty odd thousand US dollars eBay put on the table to make this thing work. Um, Aviva Insurance, other insurers are engaging because they see the opportunity to use more um, ROE parts in their repair process. So really, really important. Their repair usage uh, of reclaimed parts is you know, probably around 2%, so it's very low. Um, automotive recyclers are loving it because they've got support from eBay, they've got support from the insurers, they've got uh, collision repairers looking at taking this on. 
And importantly, one of the, you know, we've been working on this for 18 months. I've done a heap of work with Aviva and other insurers on looking at their, their current usage versus what it could be and then applying different pricing mechanisms to that uh, data to, to come up with a, an outcome or an output that says, well, if you incentivize the repairer uh, by offering them, let's say 30% of the new price, $1,000 new price, give them $300. Buy the part reclaimed at $400, add the 300 to the 400, you're still at 700 rather than 1,000. So we can show a benefit to insurers in excess of 100 pound a month, 100 pound per claim. Um, $130 odd dollars, Chad, I think that would probably work out, $240. Uh, Don, you know what that's worth to an insurance industry if you annualize that uh, across all claims. It's billions of dollars in the US, right? Absolutely. So there's a great opportunity here and there's a win-win opportunity for everyone to actually participate in and get a benefit out of it. But there needs to be, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? there needs to be a catalyst. And in, in the UK environment, eBay was the catalyst. eBay reached out to me and said, Chris, we want to do this. And we'd love to, um, to, to push this forward and make this happen. That was 18 months ago. And they've invested in that for 18 months. We've done a heap of work on certification with the Recyclers Association there with Chaz Ambrose. Um, you know, uh, last October, we had the IRT there. We were able to introduce it. You know, Chad and Scott Robertson were there on behalf of ARA. So, you know, we've done a lot of work, um, but it requires a long-term investment. And a lot of the recyclers have actually invested in that as well. So I want to, I'm putting that out there because I think it's really, really important that we're not just talking hypothetical here. This is real. In the UK today, this is real. Exactly what we're talking about is happening. Um, over the last two nights, we've run two webinars with two groups of repairers, uh, the insurance company and eBay, um, to introduce the scheme and launch the pilot. So that's going live as of today and tomorrow. Uh, um, so I think uh, for all, all the recyclers that are listening, I don't think this is La Land or it's something in the future or, you know, um, it's there. It can be done, it will be done, it's just a matter of time. Okay, so Don, talk to me a little bit about, again, putting your insurer hat on for a second, uh, but also your URG hat. Interchange, you wanted to talk about interchange and its relevance to these types of topics. What are your thoughts there? Well, I, you know, I, I think there's there's more that can be done with interchange. and. And realistically, if you can expand the part types that can be utilized in the recycling process, you're maximizing the, the benefit for the recycler. They don't have to make as much money, I think, or much profit margin on each part. Again, you're expanding the part types that they can sell. And they have to be realistically, realistically in, the, in the parts and the types of parts and that there's enough dollars for them to be able to pull it, manage it, inventory it, and put it out there. But there's so many parts that can probably be, be taken into consideration. I mean, I just was going through a little bit of a list and, you know, there's jacks and toolkits that are out there. If they could interchange and you know which ones they went to, what cars, that's just an easy one to, to throw out there and do some things with. Air shutters, wiring harnesses. Think about the cost of a wiring harness. And it, the, that would mean that the recyclers would have to take care not to cut that wiring harness, but to take it out intact. But you've got tray wrenches, you've got steering wheels, you've got running boards and running steps, you've got ERG components, extra coolers, transmission and power steering coolers, you've got extra third row seats, second and third row seats and vehicles that could be utilized. Uh, it was uh, an interior trim on a particular Mazda. I remember this years ago. A particular Mazda, a particular piece of interior trim that went around the gear shifter, $900 from the uh, manufacturer. And we were selling these things for $10. I mean, because we didn't know what they were, didn't have a way of in inventorying them. And still, that, that issue still exists today. You know, do not have an interchange number for that interior trim component, uh, don't have an OEM, OEM number related to it, and we don't know what it's worth. And then we're pricing it completely wrong, and we're losing that opportunity. Yeah. Even battery cables today, some of those battery cables are worth 600 to 1000 bucks and 1100 bucks. Simply because of computer, you know, uh, inserts. Cables now. Uh -huh. So it's it's amazing. And the other thing that is going to have to be um, 
looked at is, are the ADAS systems that are available in vehicles today? Because the older those vehicles get, those are gonna have to be taken care of in minor collisions and have to be you know, accounted for. And there ought to be a way to be able to utilize those if it can be determined that they're uh, communicating appropriately with the other systems and that can be cal calibrated appropriately after they're installed that, that should be able to be utilized and, and would repair a lot of the older vehicles with those systems in it that need to be repaired today. Yep. Yeah. Oh, look, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, the technology components in, in these vehicles are both very expensive, um, usually easy to use, they're plug and play type deals, but they do carry an element of risk with them as well that we need to be conscious of. And um, we need to be able to handle those products in such a way that um, they go through a process of sorts, you know. Do we do certain testing on them? Uh, diagnostics tools. There are new diagnostics tools coming out all the time. So my view on that, and again, I've been a little bit outspoken on this with some of the stuff I've written with different organisations, but um, things like um, certification processes for a plan. So let's call it, uh, I don't know, what do you want to call it? An ADAS computer or whatever the case is. Um, we should have a process through which that product should go through um, and how it needs to be handled, whether it's bagged and sealed or whatever the case is, uh, and a report that is printed out through a diagnostics tool that is provided with that part that is traceable. Okay, I think they're all critical components. Now, the standard automotive recycle, the traditional automotive recycle is going to look at ourselves, it's too hard. I'd rather just sell the engine. But the issue is you're not going to have an engine in three years or, or 10 years' time because they're going to be electric. So maybe it's yeah. not that extreme, but they're, they're the situations. Don, I can see you, you want to jump in here and say something. Tell me. Well, you know, to that extent, you know, scanning is, is out there and available and you, anybody can get a scanning tool. And, and, you know, the OEs provide the insight and the information for them. Uh, some of them don't like it necessarily that there's aftermarket scanners out there like AirPro and other, other companies and stuff but they're available and, and can be utilized. And if they can come in and then they can take that, and then as soon as the vehicle comes in, before it's ever dismantled, you can plug that into the system and somebody that has the technology, I mean, the technological background to read it, understand the scans and the communication standards can judge that that part is, is a good quality part that can be utilized. And as far as I know, all those uh, elements and, and those, uh, you know, front facing lane cameras and all of that is supposed to be good for the life of the car, like anything else. So if it's if it's there and it's available and it's communicating standard and its standards are right and the scanning is is appropriate, and you know, recyclers know the donor vehicle, so you can always trace it back to the donor vehicle. You can find out what the chain of of, of custody is on on that part and understand exactly where it's been, who's handled it, where it's gone. Um, and so there's ways to manage that, but you do have to have criteria in place and the recyclers have to abide by that criteria to be considered a value or, you know, a valuable place to buy from, or, you know, a valid place to buy from, I guess is a better term, uh, that I know that I'm getting a quality part and that's going to work. But the safety margin would be the calibration at the end of the, at the end of the repair process to make that. And the, I was at a CIC conference uh, about a year ago, and, and some of the uh, uh, body shops and collision people uh, were given some sessions and uh, seminars and stuff. And from what I understand, listening to them, is that the vehicle, when it goes through the recalibration process, validates that the used component is actually working correctly. And so you, you set up the process and, and put the, the target in front of the vehicle and you check all the cameras and everything is all done. And so if you did have a used component that was going on the car, that recalibration process is part of, it checks that that system is working correctly. And so the, to me, there is very li little risk associated with a used component going in an ADAS repair. Right. Well, a lot of these vehicles have to be scanned multiple times through the repair process if they do anything else. Even if you take the car in for alignment, now, it may have to be rescanned and recalibrated for certain reasons. Um, you know, it's amazing. If I was a collision repair facility today, I would only take classic cars. I can probably work on a classic car. 
I don't want to do any of the new stuff, okay? Uh, but, you know, I, I agree with you, Chad, 100%. There's, it's going to have to develop in the future. Guys, can we make, make it work appropriately? Training? My uh, internet is getting funny. Yes, you didn't well, a little you. bad mouth here while you're off. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I want to make a point, uh, Don. I want to make a point uh, right there. Um, we're talking about interchange and the interchange that um, we have as recyclers. And the best I can tell, it's different in different parts of the world since I've now been you know, multiple uh, countries now. But uh, a recycler has the opportunity to only inventory less than 300 part types. Okay. Yeah, I believe in the U.S. it's like 267. Here in Australia, it's closer to 300. But but what I've also heard is that the the new parts counter at your typical OEM dealership can supply 3,000 different part types. And so you got 3,000 different part types that could be uh, supplied through the uh, original equipment new OEM dealership parts counter, and we're only looking at less than 300 as our industry. And so I agree completely with you. The statement you opened up with in this segment is, is the fact that, that we need interchange for, for these part types. But the truth is we need interchange for the entire vehicle with a one-to-one -one match with OEM part numbers, or better yet, we just need a, a, a number that is exactly the OEM number that we're using in the background to connect uh, our components to the estimates that are being written in both the uh, collision and the mechanical repair side so that we can uh, supply every possible request that's out there. Yeah, you know, I agree with that. Here, here's the one statement I would make about that is that there are, you know, laws of diminishing returns on some of those parts. And so at, at certain points you have to say, you know, is there a is there a dollar level of those parts that that we we need to take on first, you know, and get those at a substantial level to be able to to you know have a value proposition there. I agree. Uh, but, but what we're doing though is we're selling a door assembly that may have forty different OEM part numbers associated with it, and we're selling it for for comparing it to a door shell. And oh, so yeah. that's where, that's where if, I, if I knew that there were 40 different parts in this particular door assembly and I could bill out each component separately, I'm just pulling the door off. I'm still selling the same part I've always sold, but now I'm billing out 40 different parts because I know what I've got and the, the customer is asking for those exact parts. And yeah. so that's where there's opportunity. Yeah, if the customer is asking for those parts, but half the time you, you sell a door and it goes to uh, be repaired, and all of a sudden they're removing and reinstalling the parts off the other door in it. And damn, I was really happy when I found a used door when I was out in the field writing estimates because I didn't have to interchange any parts. It was just hang it on there, change the, the trim panel, and, and go for the gold, you know? Yeah. I think so, we, we need to be a little bit careful when it comes to the interchange piece and, and how deep we go. Um, firstly, from a perspective of writing it, I've been involved and in, owned the Australian interchange here in Australia with a few others uh, for some time before Hollander uh, took it over. Um, so it's it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging piece. I'm not saying it 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 couldn't be better. It certainly could be. Um, it's one of those imperfect sciences. So writing interchange, and I can imagine Michael Ray, the interchange manager, possibly listening into this, thinking he's pulling his hair out, saying, what are they talking about? How are we going to do all that? <laughs> um, so, you know, you can have anything you want, as long as you're prepared to pay for it, I suppose. And that, that's, the, that's the challenge here. We've got to be careful what we're asking for. Um, well, you know, I understand that each one of, you know, that Hollander and, and other areas that develop interchange are constantly working on the interchange, are constantly trying to add part types as they recognize what, what the interchange would be for them and, and how it moves. And I guess it's a slow process to a certain extent unless you want to put hundreds of people in a room and work on it, you know, nonstop every day for 12 hours a day. But uh, you know, I, as we move forward, let's take the parts that really make a difference in the repair process and put those into the interchange that can can help somebody get their car repaired or save a total loss when yeah. it comes yeah. to evaluating, you know, and, and writing the, the final estimate on it. 
to help those people that really can't afford to move into another car and, and to, to manage the business that need, they need to manage. Um, yeah. I think that we owe that to the, the consumer that ultimately buys the part. Let's give them the best quality repair that's available. But yet, so consumers still pay for their own repairs a, a lot of times. And so we still got to do the right thing for them you know, as we move through the process. Sure. Sure. Um, I want to, I do want to touch back very quickly on the technology stuff and the ADAS and pre post calibration diagnostics, etc. cetera. Um, and again, it all makes sense. The vehicle that the, the donor vehicle drove to the accident, everything was working. Therefore the ECU, the airbag, whatever it is that we're talking about should work. Okay. There's no reason why it shouldn't work. And, um, we should have a scenario where um, a collision repairer slash insurer could use um, Chad's auto parts to, to buy that part because I know Chad does this and that in the process. As an insurer, though, Don, um, the risk is potentially very high. And I know I might be sort of getting a few recyclers a bit infumed here with this, but you know what, the reality is an insurer manages risk. And I'm not saying we don't do that and we shouldn't be able to supply those parts. In fact, I'm saying we should, but we need to do it the right way. And what's the right way? My view is, and I've said this a number of times, but my view is that we need to demonstrate a mechanism that is independently validated to say that Don's auto parts and Chad's auto parts do it the right way. And here it is, it's documented. Um, and it's audited and it's traceable and, you know, it's, it's, it's there. It's, in, it's part of their business process that when they take a particular part type off, it has been scanned. There's a scanned report. It's stored the way it's supposed to be stored, however that is. And it's distributed appropriately. It's not dropped. It, it, you know, all of that type of stuff needs to be documented so that an insurer can at arm's length say, I'm happy to use Don's or Chad's. But I'm not happy to use Chris's because Chris hasn't got this level of documentation slash quality control within the business that has been verified. And I think that's the missing piece at the minute, in my view. Um, and how do we get to that point? Well, I think as an industry, we need to invest in that and talk about, you know, we look at, again, I'll bring up the UK scenario, the certification program over there. There are things in that that the insurance industry required in order for a recycler to become certified, such as recalls and a recall process. They need to know that the recycler they're using has one checked for the recall part, but also has a recall process in place within their business so that if the part that they have sold off donor vehicle ABC at some point in time in the future has been recalled, that that recycler, the seller of that part, can identify that it's been recalled and then communicate to the buyer, the person they sold that part to, um, who I'd assume has put it onto the recipient vehicle, um, is aware of that recall and communicate with them and let them know that they need to contact Mazda, Dodge, whoever, GM, to have that part rectified. So there's a level of traceability here that I, I, I think we don't think deeply enough. And if we... If we go to that level, it's not easy. It's 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 more challenging, but that level of traceability is critical. Your view, Don? Well, I, I do not disagree with you, but going to that extent is a problem. I mean, you get into just the simple fact that uh, the recycler, or, well, let's just say that an insurance company has a total loss. The total loss goes to the auction company. And then, but the the insurance company put the title in their name, right? And so if a recall comes in, then half the time it's going to go to the insured. Well, or not the, well, it could go to the insured, but then if it's in, in the insurance company's name, it could go to the insurance company. Now, that car may have been sold a long time ago. And the first time it's sold, you don't know where it goes the second time or the third time, okay? And so there's a lot of issues with recalls that come in on those kind of cars to begin with. But the traceability from a selling of a part, you know, you may not have any more of those parts in stock. And so if you don't run that particular VIN to know that that part's involved and you don't have it in your inventory anymore, 
I don't know that there's systems intact or in place right now that will let you go back and search, you know, two years worth of data to try to pull out information with regard to a recall that may have gone. And then the liability is probably way past because it wasn't recalled at the time you sold it. So there's no liability there. And I'm not an attorney, so don't take this as legal advice. But, you know, there's really not any liability there for the recycler that sold that part at that point in time because there was no recall. Now, if there was recall on it and they sold it, they probably shouldn't be in the recycling parts industry anymore. But that's another question. Are you going to wipe out 90% of the industry? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, maybe, maybe not. Not necessarily. I think, uh, you know, again, like URG has developed a recall protocol for the recyclers. And now they can go on once a day, twice a day, five times a day, or whatever, and batch 10,000 bins to find out if there's any recalls on any parts through that process. So that's one of the things we want to do for our industry members to be able to go back in and check of that and make sure that they're not allowing those type of parts to get back in the stream of commerce because we're as safety conscious as anybody. Yeah. But Chad, your business, uh, when you were running it, you have product liability, right? Absolutely. You had product liability and every part you sold, that's just part of your business model. And it you could have been a million. It could have been, yeah, it could have been a million. It could have been three million. Okay. Yeah. Seven million. Okay. And so then realistically, if the collision industry just really understood what was going on, if uh, Chad also offered warranty on probably most of the parts that he sold and he could offer warranty on every part and lifetime on sheet metal if he wanted to, and also give a labor warranty along with that. And so realistically, the collision industry is not looking at the fact that if something happened to those parts, then they could look back at the recycler and say, Hey, by the way, here's the deal, you know, here's what happened to the part and we need you to work with us to get this resolved. Okay. And so there's all kinds of things that, that really nobody's taken into consideration when it, when they look at these parts and how to manage those. And if you also gave that warranty that the recycled parts came with to the person that was picking up the car that they knew that they could go in and get that changed out or taken care of, any time after the, the one, as long as, you know, after the, the, the repair, for as long as they own that vehicle, you know, it's a, it's a easy sell, realistically, if you wanted to take the time to do that. But most people, when they get their car repaired and it's got repaired with recycled parts, don't even know there's the warranty backing the, the recycled part in back of the collision repair facility. Yeah. So it's got a double warranty on it, you know, realistically. I think what we're talking about here, though, and I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I certainly agree that and the, the program you've got with the recall uh, stuff is, is really important, really good. Um, notwithstanding that it's difficult, the question then becomes, what if we could? And what could we do to actually make that happen? Because then... We're in a different situation. If we think about it, let's walk a mile in the insurer's uh, uh, shoes here for a second. We've been talking about how we can incentivize an insurer to use more parts and how the insurer can incentivize the repairer to use more parts. I don't have to tell you, you were at State Farm for 75 years. Uh, sorry. Don't, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it feels like it's a thing. Um. <laughs> but as you know, uh, an ins for an insurer to use those safety slash technology components, ADAS, sensors, ECUs, lane detection, blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to give them, some, telling them that we have product liability insurance is not going to cut, cut oh, because they're yeah. authorizing that part on the repair. So we need to think beyond what we offer as an insurance. That's for us. That, that's to protect us, not to protect the person that's driving around with that Takata rear back in. Yeah. Right? And well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, the other thing I was going to say was that um, it's, it's also not so much about where the liability starts and finishes. Whether we sold that product, let's call it an airbag because it's topical, the Takata airbag, we sold it and at the time it wasn't recalled, but now it is recalled. We are the part seller. It was our product 
And to a degree, we need to make sure that we can find a way to trace that. And if we can do that, then all of a sudden, our parts become a lot more usable to a very risk averse and very, very large segment that we're currently not supplying much product to. And that's the insurance industry. Right. You know, there, there, you know, you'd have to look at that as a futuristic pro process or a project to put into place. But the one thing that, that is problematic to that, just thinking about it up front, is that as a recycler, I sell it to the collision repair facility. The collision repair facility, okay, so I won't know who the owner or the donor vehicle necessarily is. I might, and if we start requesting VIN numbers to double check the accuracy of the parts that we're providing to the collision industry, that could help in that process. So, it, it, you know, VIN to VIN stuff is going to be instrumental, I think, as we move forward in the future to be able to validate the accuracy of the part selection going on the vehicle. Now, if, if you had that, then you, but you'd still have to go from the recycler back to the, the, um, uh, to the uh, body shop. Then the body shop would have to go back to who they repaired the car for if it's there. And if it's been sold or, you know, something else done with it, then, you know, how far do you try to trace that and manage it? There's uh, only so much it, we can do there. Right. It yeah. is problematic. But, you know, I think that's something that might be able to be done in the future. But again, the problem would be is that going back, how often do you run, you know, uh, recall information on vehicles that you've already sold the inventory out of? I mean, it pretty well it's gone and it's not part of your inventory. So then there would be another process, I think, and Chad, you can probably answer this better than I can, that would have to be put into place to go back, you know, once every six months or a year and look at something, but that's... You're looking at it from the wrong angle. You're, you're looking at it from the recycler having to be proactive to find that recall part. When the truth is you need to partner with somebody that is, uh, has a system that is doing that work for you. And when that recall comes out that affects well, then your partner sends you a message that says uh, this particular part has been recalled now on this particular VIN that is in your inventory and you need to follow up on it. And so it's a proactive from the opposite side of it. So you're just looking at it a little bit differently. And that's the way our system works in the Australian market and now okay. the market where we're, we get the batch of VINs from the, the uh, recycler. We're checking them for recalls at the, the time that we get them reporting that data back to them. And then we're monitoring those for future recalls. If there's a future recall occurs, boom, you get an email that says, here's a recall that just occurred yesterday and it affects this part on this VIN that's in your inventory. And so it's, it's a proactive from the okay. opposite. So you're, you're active in their inventory. So you're getting a daily download of inventory and information. We're using them. historical downloads and historical searches to alert them to future recalls. And so it's still a manual process to connect one to one. And oh, so, okay. so, yeah, and we're, you know, in order to do that and, and really, I think, be successful at it, it's got to be an automated approach that, that nobody has to touch um, because I'm as lazy as anybody. Well, maybe lazier than some, but, you know, if it's going to create more um, touches uh, from the recycler point of view or, or from another you know, uh, other individuals, then is it going to be done? Is it going to be done correctly and, and managed correctly? And you can have the best programs, but if they're not managed correctly and, and implemented right, and then the criteria set and then managed correctly after the fact, it is, you know, it's all good to say, but it won't work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, from that comment, you've obviously worked a long time in the insurance industry. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so look, I, I think you're right, but it's again, it's that good old chicken and egg. Um, oh, what, absolutely. What can we do? What what investment do we need to make in the future in order to entice those buyers we're looking to engage with, such as the insurance industry and the air collision repair networks? What do what investment do we need to make in order to entice them to engage with us and actually start using more of our products? And at the same time, on the flip side, it's what can they do? to incentivize the use of our product as well. 
And it's not going to happen overnight. As I said to you, the UK stuff that we've been doing with eBay and, and insurers, including Aviva, it's been 18 months in the making and we're just having the repair of meetings now. And recyclers have invested heavily. The VRA has invested heavily. Um, eBay's invested heavily. The insurers have invested heavily all along the way. But there was a strategic path towards an end. And we're not there yet. We're probably just coming off the blocks, right? Um, so we've still got to run the race. But to get to that starting point, it's a, it's a long-term piece. And I think we've, we've got a few minutes left, on from a URG perspective, um, from an ARA perspective, from whoever's industry affiliation slash association perspective um, and, and group, you have a really, um, how can I put it, a really important role to play, no pressure, but you have a, an important role to play in how we guide these strategies into the future. Um, I'm not sure if I'm putting it right there, but you know, the auto recycler is busy on a day-to-day -day basis running their business and trying to stay in, in business and make money and increase their margin if they can. Um, the URG network and, and you are the URG organization, I think has a really, really critical role to play in that. Um, supporting its members by developing, as you have with a lot of the stuff you've got on your website now, um, developing these strategies and, and then taking them to the different organisations such as insurers, but then also bringing people along and, you know, winning their hearts and minds really at both sides, you know, from a, uh, the, the downstream, from a, a customer perspective, but also upstream from your members' perspective. We need to win everyone's hearts and minds and bring them together um, so that we can achieve that common goal. Otherwise, this side saying, I'm waiting for you, this side saying, I'm waiting for you, and everyone saying, well, you're not doing anything. Well, URG, I think, is in a beautiful position to be able to drive that. I think you're absolutely right. I think we have the obligation to, to facilitate a medium of the minds between the collision industry, the insurance industry, uh, and, and the recycling industry, but, but also with the OEs. I think that, that as a as a group, we ought to sit down more, talk more about the issues and how we can better facilitate the repairability of automobiles and do it correctly so that there's a kind of economy of, of scale with that. But we all want safe repairs. I don't want to stick my six kids, well, maybe part of my six kids I would, but I don't want to <laughs> stick them in a bad car um, and an unsafe car um, uh, to run around in. But I have no no issue, and I never have, in utilizing the right part types to go in the car. Uh, and with six kids, you had to buy a lot of recycled parts as you were going through the process. So, um, but yeah, we have an important job to do as we move forward, and we have to be looking at the future and what's important to carry on, you know, the recycling industry for the next five to ten years at least. Now, after ten years, I probably won't care about it much more anymore, but. Uh, uh, hopefully I'll be retired someday. Uh, but uh, for right now, I'm hanging in there. So Very good. Uh, I agree totally. I think uh, the, the role is critical. It's, it's a guiding role. It's a, a nurturing role. It's, and it's not going to happen overnight. It does take time. But I think really important, if we can start going down that path, that's where it's at. It's, and as I said, it's, to use the jargon, it's, it's a bit of that journey, right? We need to start taking that. We need to start training for it. You know, you're not going to run a marathon tomorrow because you want to run one. You have to train for a year before you can actually run it. At your age, Absolutely. maybe a little bit longer, but Don, I'm not sure. But as I said, I, I think URG has, has a really important role. They've done really well to date. We're going to finish up now, Don, but this year you didn't have your conference. Um, and I know ARA is running a virtual conference. It just came out the other day really difficult times from a, a, an association slash uh, group perspective. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, in a minute or so, what that feels like at the minute, how, how you're going with all that stuff. Well, I mean, it was very difficult for us to give up that conference because it means, uh, you know, so much to us. And, and that conference, um, you know, it's not a moneymaker for URG. We don't try to, to make a profit on it. In fact, we lose on it. But we wanted to keep the cost at, at a level that we could attract recyclers from all over the country uh, and all over the world. 
and, and we were able to do so, and we had some terrific and, and fantastic people speaking uh, at it. And, and um, uh, But I think it's one of those conferences that people come to and they just learn, and they learn more from interaction between the people than they do necessarily in all the sessions. Uh, right. And we were running six sessions an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, for our meetings. Um, but we are confident, at least I, I, I'm going to say that, that we're going to have it next year and next in April in Dallas. But it's, uh, you know, it, that's important to the industry, I think. I, I think this is one of those industries that really needs to be together and mm -hmm. needs to have that cold drink and sit down and talk philosophy and strategies and what works and what doesn't work. And, and move through the process that way. Uh, because, you know, I learned so much from, you know, being at the ARA and being at URG and, and having the recyclers do a lot of complaining to me about why we weren't doing, you know, certain things. But, you know, it was a learning process for me and it helped me understand the basics of, of what it is to, to try to be a recycler and be an entrepreneur that they really are. I mean, you take something, from a, you take a damaged car and, and you were able to make a business and make money out of it, you're good, man, you're good. So, uh, and, and these guys are, are very literate, they're very educated, they're finance majors, attorneys, they're people that come from all walks of life, but they do a fantastic job. And, and again, I'm just happy to be a part of this and be able to support them and be able to help build some of the technology and be, a, you know, and provide some of the educational opportunities that can help them be successful. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, I think on that note, um, you guys, you mentioned ARA, you, everyone's doing a, a super job at, at keeping the industry together. Um, I know Mike French does his toolbox thing. Um, we do this type of stuff. Uh, there's other stuff happening in the U UK. I think um, the more of, those things to keep people together, to bring people together and actually start sharing some of this is going to be critical, more critical now than ever. Um, even if they are going to be virtual, um, I urge everyone to support what, what you're doing, what the ARA is doing with their virtual um, event. I think it's November. Um, support it, guys. Uh, the industry needs uh, groups like URG, uh, like PRP, like whoever else it is, right, um, the ARA, to be active and to actually be having these discussions that we're having here, Don. And, and it'd be great to, to maybe look at next year's conference, touch wood if we can, if we can have one, and, and uh, have the URG conference um, and talk about more about this type of stuff. And rather than just a little bit here for an hour or five minutes here and five minutes there, we think about it how we can actually attract the right audience as well beyond the automotive recycling industry because we're talking their language. How can we get insurance companies and collision repairs to sort of attend possibly a show that has a session specifically on this or a morning specifically on this about them and how we can help them? Maybe that's an option. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that totally, Chris. Excellent. Okay, we've gone five minutes over. Chad. Anything else from you? No, no, I think we've covered it. Uh, it's exciting what uh, the future holds for the automotive recycling industry and uh, some collaboration with the uh, affiliated industries, the OEs, the insurers, uh, repairers and stuff uh, are only going to increase our, our pro profitability, our sales and uh, our reach in the marketplace. And so uh, if URG is the one to, to drive that, then I'll, I'll give you my support. And um, we, uh, we appreciate what you're doing for the industry, Don, and, uh, and uh, just thankful for you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate all that you guys do every day. Uh, and Chad, I've known you for a while now, and you've always steered me straight on certain things. So, <laughs> so you've never thrown me a curveball yet, so I like that. So, he throws them to me every day. day. Right. <laughs> I'll be honest, everybody I can talk to, everybody else. Can. All day, every day, Don. I'm, I'm going like this behind my computer because it's throwing stuff at you. Yeah. So, now, <laughs> thanks, so guys. It's, thanks, Don. It's great. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate the time. 
Uh, everyone that's on the on the call, thanks very much for attending today. Uh, look forward to announcing next week's uh, show. Um, appreciate your time and uh, goodbye. Have a good day. All right. Take care. Yes. Bye. Bye.